In our thermal physics class recently, we've been studying phase transitions. And in particular, in class recently, we looked at the phase transitions of calcium carbonate, CaCO3, which has two solid phases corresponding to different crystal structures, calcite and aragonite, which I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of the name, but whatever. Uh, there are those two phases, and clever experimentalists have gone and tabulated all sorts of great data about those. So we've got the entropy per mole of each one, volume per mole, thermal uh, expansion coefficient for each one of those. You can get a lot more things. These are the ones we're going to talk about today. And in class, we worked out an important thing. We, these, this data is all put together at standard temperature and pressure, 25 degrees Celsius and one bar of pressure. Uh, in class, we figured out, based on this information and uh, some other things, that the Gibbs free energy for uh, calcite is lower than for aragonite at standard temperature and pressure. So calcite is the more stable form. What we actually found by using a thermodynamic identity was that calcite remains the most stable all the way up to 3.6 kilobars of pressure, 3.6 times 10 to the 8th pascals. That's a lot of pressure, thousands of atmospheres. And uh, so above that pressure, aragonite is more stable. And we talked in class about how geologically that's where aragonite comes from, is when it forms deep below the earth with the high pressures, yada, yada, yada. The uh, point is, that's not our concern today. What I want to talk about now is the question, if you are up at that point, 25 degrees Celsius, 3.6 kilobars of pressure, if you're at that point and you're in the aragonite phase, how much energy does it cost per mole to transform the aragonite into calcite? Uh, by definition, that question is asking, what is the latent heat of this system? And so uh, we can engage with this on three levels. The first level is for the people with really short attention spans. I'll give you a formula. You can just plug it in. More deep than that, I want to tell you why the formula is there, why we use the equation we do to talk about latent heat. And then, after we've gotten to that, I'll tell you that the whole calculation we were doing was a lie and we have to fix it. Uh, but it wasn't a very big lie. It's not a huge fix, but it's noticeable. So that's our plan. So first of all, the equation. What's the equation for latent heat of a system? Well, uh, I can just tell you there's a formula that we can find in our textbook in lots of places. The latent heat is T times delta S, or in other words, temperature in Kelvin, of course, times S final is S calcite minus S aragonite. That's our, that's our equation. That's what we've got. And if I put this together, 25 degrees Celsius is 298 Kelvin times entropy of calcite, 92.9 kilojoules, no, sorry, just joules, 92.9 joules per Kelvin per mole, minus S aragonite, 88.7 joules per Kelvin per mole. And if I put that all together, I'll just cite a result. You can multiply it yourself. It's great. You'll get 1.25 kilojoules per mole. The Kelvin cancels out. So we're left with 1.25 kilojoules per mole. And if you are the impatient sort, there you go. It's latent heat. Latent heat is telling us basically the cost to change the entropy of your system. That's, that's what this equation tells us. Okay, those of you who actually care about the subject and want to know why this is what latent heat is, why we do this, let's engage with this a little bit more. Let's talk about where this came from. Uh, if we're at this transition point between the 3.6 kilobar, 25 degrees Celsius point, at that transition point, at a phase boundary, If you're at a phase boundary, the whole point is that the Gibbs free energy of calcite equals the Gibbs free energy of aragonite per mole or whatever per something you're doing. The Gibbs free energies are equal. That's the important thing. That's how we defined where the phase transformation point was. Well, how do we use that? It turns out that uh, that means we can say our delta G equals zero at that point. Yeah, delta G being just calcite minus aragonite final minus initial. And then, by definition, G could be written as, and I've got to write it in a form in terms of enthalpy, uh, G can be written as enthalpy minus temperature times entropy 
of your system, g equals h minus t s, and uh, that means then that delta g is equal to delta h minus, okay, delta t s. But if we're at that phase transition point, remember how phase transitions work. You keep pumping energy in, and instead of changing the temperature like you normally do when you add heat, you instead of changing the temperature, you just change matter from one phase to the other. So in this case, temperature is a constant for the whole period of the phase transformation, and we can write this as T delta S. And that is zero for us. Okay, why is that important? Well, the idea is, I've written it in terms of enthalpy instead of the full energy minus PV plus, uh, plus PV minus TS form. I've written it in terms of enthalpy because we are at a, at a phase transformation point. We are at constant pressure. We're in a constant pressure environment. And so it's natural to think about that just like it, when we add heat to this, we're going to be staying at that one point in the phase diagram as we transform from one to the other. So enthalpy is the natural variable to talk about when we're doing processes at constant pressure. Uh, it's exactly what we want. And in fact, uh, I'll, we've used this. I don't need that right now. In fact, at constant pressure, we've seen in class, based on some thermodynamics, that delta H is equal to Q plus work other. Work other, the whole idea of that is it's something other than the standard pressure times volume work. It's not P, integral of PDV, but it's anything else, you know, microwaving the thing or pushing it or something. Well, we're going to say work other is zero. We're, we're in some geological process or something where we're not mixing it or microwaving it or something. We're just adding heat. And so the heat that we add is exactly delta H. That's why we care about this. We want to have the P delta V, PDV work built in. That's where we're doing enthalpy, to have that work built into enthalpy. And we just want to know how much energy do we need to add in addition to what the surrounding rocks are going to do. Okay, so it, we, this is Q equals delta H. We really can, the Q now, Q in this special case, is latent heat. So Q equals L equals delta H equals T delta S. And so that's the origin of this handy formula that latent heat is T times delta S. It comes directly from the Gibbs free energies being equal and enthalpy being the right variable to talk about when you were holding uh, pressure constant and adding heat to, uh, to change the energy of your system without any you know, funky extra kinds of work going on at the same time. All right, so again, we've reached a point where totally fair game to stop because we've explained this formula. But the one other thing I want to do is say we have fibbed in doing this calculation. And in particular, I fibbed right here where I took my 92.9 and my 88.7 uh, joules per Kelvin per mole en uh, entropy values because these entropy values, remember, were calculated at standard temperature and pressure. Those entropy values were calculated at standard temperature and pressure, and we're totally not at standard pressure anymore. We're much higher than that. So the question is, should these two entropy values have changed by when we went up to 3.6 kilobars? Uh, I'm guessing yes. And in fact, it turns out we've done in our class a homework problem that, uh, believe it or not, touched on exactly this question. I want to know how entropy changes when I change pressure, right? I want to know, to be able to answer this question, to be able to figure out what S should be, what are SC and SA at T equals 25 Celsius, P equals 3.6 kilobar. To do that, I need to hold temperature constant from SDP and go straight up my phase diagram uh, up to this higher pressure. I need to know the rate of change of entropy with respect to pressure at constant temperature. That's what I need. Well, what luck, it actually is luck, I didn't plan this, uh, in, in our class we solved a problem 
where we showed that DSDP using a Maxwell relation, partial derivative relationships from thermodynamic identities for the Gibbs free energy, I believe, we showed that DSDP at constant temperature is equal to negative, negative dV dt at constant pressure. That's what we found. This is one of the Maxwell relations. And hey, the fun part is this dV dt at constant pressure is precisely is, is very directly related to the uh, thermal expansion coefficient of our thing. This is volume with respect to temperature, change of volume with respect to temperature, and the def by definition, beta was the fractional change in volume, so delta v over v, over delta t. That was the definition of beta, the thermal expansion coefficient, volume thermal expansion coefficient. And so this was defined, at, roughly speaking, at constant pressure. Now, it, you know, that was the natural definition. It wasn't originally mentioned. But constant pressure is the assumption there. And in fact, in our problem, we, in the problem that we did in class, we even showed that uh, using this, we even showed in that problem that ds dp at constant t is minus beta times the volume per mole of our substance. Or, well, if this is one mole, then that's volume per mole. And it's, this is our nice, nice relationship. And the cool thing is, we can look up beta and we can look up volume. Volume, it turns out, only changes by about 0.5%. I've looked this up elsewhere between uh, you know, standard pressure and 3.6 kilobars. So the volume of either one of these is going to be a minuscule change. The interesting thing, though, is this beta is going to be important. So this is going to be pretty close to constant. Beta is pretty close to constant over this range. And so what do we do? Uh, we, we just integrate this up, basically. We're going, if we treat this as a constant, then our we can say, what's our change? in the entropy of calcite. That change in entropy of calcite is going to be, um, I guess, you know, it's the integral of ds dp at constant temperature dp going from 1 bar to 3.6 kilobar. That's our integral that we have to do. And if this is pretty much a constant, beta and V are both pretty much constant in that range, we can say this is roughly just a product. It's going to be minus beta V delta P. And we can work this out. That tells me then, coming up here, change in entropy of calcite is roughly minus beta V times, my delta P is just the full 3.6 kilobar because one bar more or less makes no difference there. And when I do that, I can end up putting this together. I'm not going to multiply in front of you. I end up getting, multiply all that out, negative uh, 0 0.27. 0.27 joules per Kelvin per mole. By the exact same reasoning, I can do the same thing for aragonite. It's going to be a larger change because its beta is about three times as big. So I expect about three times, as, you know, V is pretty similar. I expect about three times as much. And indeed, when I plug everything in for this, I get negative 0 0.80 joules per Kelvin per mole. Now, those are pretty small changes on the scale of 92 or 88. But it turns out that we're subtracting. We're looking at differences. And so this actually becomes more complicated. It becomes a more complicated thing. Uh, I will keep my color code here. This means then that SC measured at 3.6 kilobar is equal to 92.9 minus, call it 0.3, to write, to, you know, keeping sig figs about the right. Uh, that gives me 92.6 joules per Kelvin per mole. And then I can go over and do a similar thing. I can say that my S aragonite at 3.6 kilobar equals 
Again, I take this 88.7, I subtract 0 0.8, that gives me 87.9 joules per Kelvin per mole. And suddenly, my delta S here, the difference between those two S's, suddenly, the difference between those two S's that I have turns out to be delta S is this minus this. Where are we? Uh, my delta S it, between the two phases ends up being 4.7 uh, uh, joules per Kelvin per mole. And finally, I can work out my L equals T delta S multiply that by my same 298 Kelvin times 4.7 joules per Kelvin per mole. And that ends up being roughly, uh, when I multiply it out, roughly 1.4 kilojoules per mole, which is not quite the same as the 1.25 kilojoules per mole we had previously. This is a correction. This makes a, this makes a difference. It gets us up to a, a different level of this, it means that the correction for entry was important in getting this answer. So uh, that's our that, that's a gist at least about how phase transitions work, why we care, why latent why latent heat has the equation that it does, and why we have to, have to worry a little bit about making sure that our quantities scale up properly to the point where we're measuring them. Uh, they're fairly constant in a lot of cases, but not as constant as you'd like perhaps. And you want to you want to watch out for that. You want to be careful. With that, thank you for watching, and I hope you learned something.